Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, do you guys remember how I've talked about that I'm not a morning person? <laughs> and how I, I, I had to get up at some stupid hour to, to be able to like trick my body into being here and being like lucid and cognizant? Yeah. Do you remember in 1966 when our amazing government decided that an idea from World War I to save fuel at the time should be something that everybody gets to do, where they just dilly-dally with the whole concept of time, daylight savings, remember that? Yeah. And they thought, you know, it might be a little confusing to just mess with the whole fabric of time, the very thing that we use to measure life and experience. We don't want to confuse people. So, well, on middle of the night on Saturday... When everybody else is all tucked, all snug in their beds, they can wake up whenever they want on Sunday morning and adjust before they have to go back to work on Monday. Hardly anyone will be affected by this change. They'll, all, they'll just enjoy the extra time with light. Um, hi, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm hardly anyone, and I am exhausted. I am so tired after waking up at basically 3 o'clock this morning and maybe... Well, you guys are the late service. Maybe you were supposed to come to the early service, and you're like, oh, this is a convenient, happy thing, right? Yeah, so, well, welcome. Welcome to those of you online who maybe uh, woke up too late. It's great to have you as well. Let's go to God in prayer, because I need it. Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you speak today. I know that I've scribbled down some words, Lord, but I pray that your Holy Spirit is doing the work, because anything that you have is better than what I have. Whatever you have prepared, whatever you want to speak to each person here, I know, I know that's better than anything that I wrote down. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in this moment, in this place, would be at work even in me and through me. I submit myself to you, and I pray that everybody be willing to do the same. Lord, let your Holy Spirit speak and preach in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Our main reading today will come from our gospel reading, commonly known as the story of the woman at the well. Now, it's funny because as I was kind of thinking about this, I think that term, woman at the well, actually is more well known than the story itself. I think it's kind of used in facsimile for, for some things, but when you look at the context of the story, when you look at what actually happens in this story known as the woman at the well, there's a lot there. There are a lot of things going on. There's a lot of context that in order to fully understand all the nuances, you really have to grasp the context of this conversation. And it truly is. It's a conversation. Like, we love the Bible. We love all the other parts. We believe that, that God is inspiring the Bible, that it is an inerrant. But when you see a conversation with Jesus himself, like, yeah. And this is actually the longest dialogue that Jesus has ever recorded. Not with one of his disciples, not with Nicodemus, this well-known religious figure. No, it's with this random Samaritan woman. And I think there's something significant to that. So uh, the context here is this, right? That it says just before our reading, it kind of picks up at a weird spot, just before our reading that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He's, he's traveling from Judea to Galilee. And a little geography lesson, there are kind of three regions in this particular part of the world at this time. There's the southernmost, that is Judea, and then there's the northernmost, which is Galilee. The part in the middle is known as Samaria. And if you've heard sermons on this story or sermons on the Good Samaritan, you know that Samaria was kind of no man's land for Israelites, for Jewish people. There wasn't a lot of good relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, to the point where if you're in Judea and you're looking to travel to Galilee or vice versa, and you are what could be considered a pious, devout Jew, oftentimes you would travel to the east, right, out over the Jordan River, along through a, another area, and then over the Jordan River again to get into Galilee. Right? And they're trying to avoid this Samaria region. Maybe you're asking, like, what's the deal? Why don't they get along? Well, it goes back to 722 B.C. Assyria came in, conquered this whole region, specifically the northern region of this area. And uh, either those that were there, the Israelites left, or they were taken into captivity. Some of them kind of remained in that area. And over time, intermarried with some of the other Gentiles, the, the actual the pagan Gentiles that came in from other places. 
And with that, then their religion that was Judaism, which was considered the one true religion among obviously devout Jews, it became kind of this weird blended religion as they started to adopt some of the pagan rituals and, and mindset. And it ended up becoming its own thing. And so for the Jews, they looked at Samaria, and not only was it full of, of Gentiles, but it was also full of this, this kind of weird crossbred uh, group of people that they would say, okay, Gentiles, they don't know any better. They, they didn't, weren't brought up in this, but, but those who are ancestrally Israelites have turned their back on what we believe to be true. They've turned their back on, on the one true God. They should know better, and so there was a lot of animosity there. And more than just animosity, there was straight up violence. It was not safe for somebody who is Jewish to pass through Samaria. Um, think like Belfast in the 90s, right? Where there's Ireland, Republic of Ireland, then Northern Ireland. How they really, it's, it's more than just they don't like each other. There's actual conflict on religious ideology levels. That's kind of what we're dealing with there, right? So it says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. Well, uh, there was a well-known alternate route. Why didn't he take this other path? I'm sure, I'm sure his disciples grumbled about it, right? Like, why are we going through this dangerous area? Why are we going through this area full of unclean people? Literally, within uh, the devout Jews, they believed that Samaritans were unclean, that anything that they did, anything that they touched were considered unclean. And so I'm sure they grumbled about it. It was more than just uncomfortable. It was unsafe. So again, why did Jesus have to Go through Samaria because he had to be in this town at this well at this time to meet this woman. He knew that he had to reach her. This is the embodiment of Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He needed to have this conversation. See, because he knew that in order to reach people, you have to go to where they are. If you want to reach somebody, you have to go to where they are. It's like this. If you're a firefighter, you don't just stand outside of the burning building hoping that the people who are inside come out. You don't just say, hey, that building's on fire. It's uncomfortable for me to go in there. I'm not doing that. No, you go in and you rescue them. You save them. Which makes me ask the question, you got anybody in your life who's in a burning building? You got anybody who's going through a difficult time? Oh, stop standing outside and hoping that they'll come to you. Stop standing there waiting for them to approach you. No, go get them. Go in there and save them. But let's go back to our story here. This is a unique encounter at a unique time. And perhaps you've heard before, but there's some context here. So the sixth hour and the Jewish clock, right? Because, you know, it's all, today's all about changing clocks, apparently. Um, that is noon for us. It's midday. And so they're in the desert, and it's lot, probably summer, probably the hot season, and based on kind of looking at calendars. Um, and you're talking 100 plus, 110 plus degrees, and they find themselves at this well. Now, culturally, it would make sense that you would go to the well in the morning right? Because you want to avoid the heat of the day and you need water for like the morning stuff, right? Like cooking, cleaning, etc. So typically they would go in the morning as a group to the well. The well was about a half mile away from town. We have a pretty good idea of where Sakar is modern day, where this well is. It's about half mile or so. And Sakar, incidentally, is at the intersection of two trade routes. And so it would have been a prime place for bandits, for robbers, and so the idea was, as these women of the town would go to gather the water, uh, they would go in numbers. They would have a whole group because their strength in numbers, right? They would also just kind of make it a social thing. That was how they started their day. You know, they'd go and they'd chat, they'd sing songs, whatever it is, right? They'd have a good time together. But we see this woman going at noontime. She's already well past the morning. She is at the hottest part of the day. She's traveling by herself, unsafe. Why? Because this woman's been through it. Because she has lived her life in condemnation from the town. 
She is so tired of being judged. She's so tired of hearing the whispers about her. She's so tired of people giving her the side eye that she says, you know what? It's easier for me to just isolate myself. It's easier for me to just do this myself, to go, even though it's dangerous, even though it's inconvenient, even though it is as hot as could be, this is just easier than having to deal with all those people. But then she gets there, and there's this, this Jewish man, and, and she begins to put up those familial, familiar walls, right? Because she spent her whole life putting up walls. So you don't go to the well at midday apart from everybody else if you don't have walls up in your life. And so she goes and she encounters Jesus. She knows he's Jewish probably because of the way he looks or maybe with his, his accent. We don't really know, but she knows he's Jewish. And those walls start coming up, and she starts hitting them with them one by one, right? First, she goes with race. She says, hey, you're Jewish. I'm Gentile. We don't see eye to eye. We don't get along. Our people aren't friendly. Then she hits them with gender. It says, I'm a Samaritan woman. There's a whole rule about men and women talking in private conversation. Man normally wouldn't approach a woman in this situation, right? I mean, Mike Pence could never, Right? You ever think about the fact that if Billy Graham and his rule that he never had a private meeting with a woman other than his wife, if he was Jesus, this woman would be in hell? We're thinking about it. So Jesus, you know, she says, I'm a woman. And then she hits him with religion. She says, like, you're Jewish. I'm Samaritan. There's, there's a worship gap here. Your people consider my people unclean. I, you're asking me for a drink, but you can't even touch the cup. According to your ritual laws that I'm holding, that I'm offering to, you can't even drink from the same vessel as me. She's hitting them with all these walls that are, quite frankly, excuses. They're just ways to keep him further away. And Jesus straight up doesn't care. He just plows right through them. He says, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. Uh, different race, whatever, different gender, cool, that's fine. Different. He just doesn't care because he is there to speak to her. And they have this little exchange where, where he says, can you give me a drink, right? Because he didn't have the implements necessary to get a drink. And she says, well, I'm Samaritan, I, I, and you're Jewish, and, and I'm a woman, and, and, and all these things. And, and he says, listen, if you knew who I was, I could offer you living water. It's hard to catch this in English, but in Hebrew, the living water um, could also mean running water, right? So he could be referring to a spring, kind of a play on words. He says, I offer you living water. And she goes, how are you going to drink this living water? You just cup it up with your hands. You don't, you don't have anything to drink with. But boy, that'd be nice. It'd be nice to have a drink where I didn't get thirsty again. Why? Because she's tired of this whole song and dance of going in the middle of the day. She's tired of this inconvenience. She's tired of having to face the town. And then ultimately, Jesus says, go get your husband. Now, this seems like kind of a rude statement, right? Seems like kind of a, a, a bit upfront for Jesus to do this, but here's the deal. Jesus knows that all those other walls that he busted through, race, gender, religion, he knows that they're just obstacles. And he knows the real wall, the one that she has built up and fortified throughout her life is her identity and her immorality. That she has made herself to be an immoral person. She is certain that that is what defines her. And this wall of immorality, the one thing she didn't want to talk about are her mistakes of her past. And so all those other walls were just to keep him further and further away. And Jesus says, no, 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 let's talk about that. Let's talk about the real thing, the real issue here. For this woman, it's immorality, right? It's revealed that she's had five husbands. She's on her sixth man now. Like even in modern times, that's a lot. Like we're talking Old West brothel marrying the customers kind of situation, right? Fill in the gaps. And, and you're going, okay, I, as somebody who, who counsels, I, I want to look at this woman and say, what happened in your early life? What kind of trauma have you been through that you keep seeking this companionship that clearly hasn't worked out very well? You keep seeking to have this, this spouse, and it's not even just companionship. You're, you're marrying them. Something has happened here in your life. You have some sort of wound, some sort of trauma from your past that has gotten you to this point that you've built up this wall that says, you know what, the rest of the world, forget it, but I still need to find somebody to be in my life. And she's built up this wall, and Jesus walks right up to it and says, let's talk about it. Listen. Maybe you're sitting here, 
You are sitting here today, not maybe, you are, I promise, and you have some wall in your life. You have something in your life that you have built a wall around, and you're scared of letting others in. Maybe, like this woman, it is some sort of immorality, some habit, some addiction, something that you have built up that you are so scared of. Maybe it's just one mistake from your past, and you built this wall, and you're like, that's, that's the thing we don't touch. That's the thing we don't talk about. That's, that's too vulnerable. Maybe it's an insecurity, something to do with who you are, your body, your mind, whatever it is. Maybe it's a wound, something that happened to you in the past. We all have these walls, and they are thick. We don't let people in. And maybe you're sitting here today saying, no, 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 not me. See, what the thing is, we build all these other walls and we make that look as nice as possible. We say, oh, my inner courtyard, it's all good, it's all nice. It's, we have this facade that will let people, will say, oh, you're my friend now, I'll let you in, but you're not letting them into the center. You're not letting them into that inner wall. You're not letting them get to the thing that you are so concerned about. And Jesus, he walks right up and he says, let's talk about it. Let's do this. Because Jesus sees this woman sitting there at the well. At this point, she has to be affected by this. At this point, she has to go, whoa, hold on. You're saying things that nobody else knows that, that, that maybe the town gossip talks about. You're hitting me to my very core. But he doesn't see her for that. He doesn't see her for her mistakes. He doesn't see her for immorality. He doesn't say, you're the worst person I've ever encountered. No, he says that you are my child. You are deserving of being saved just like everybody else that I encounter. I came here to talk to you. I don't know what brought you here today. Maybe you're here every single week. Maybe you just get up and you're like, oh, well, I guess it's time to go to church. That's just what happens. Maybe you just decided to come and you're hearing me for the first time. God brought you here to speak to you today. That God would let you know that your identity isn't in your mistakes. Your identity isn't in your sins and your habits and your immorality. Your identity isn't in your past and your wounds and your trauma. Your identity isn't in your insecurities. Your identity is the fact that you were made by the almighty God who knows you and loves you. He knows about everything that's beyond that wall and yet he still looks at you. He's still here now saying, I love you. I know you and nothing is going to change that love. My prayer is that we are strong enough to trust our God, to go to our God and say, God, I am so scared to share this with anybody in my life, but I can trust in you in prayer. And that over time, we'll grow strong enough to, to surround ourselves with the community. Because here's the thing about this woman at the well. Our reading ends before this, but it says that she goes back to the town and says, guys, I just met the most incredible person. He said he's the Messiah. And you know what happens? The town doesn't go, oh, her. They believe her. Is it possible that this definition that she had given herself, that she said the town looks down on me, they say that's the lady who's had five husbands and she's with a sixth guy now and she's no good. Is it possible that she was putting that definition on herself and the town missed her? The community longed for her. They wanted her to be back because they believed her. They listened to her. What definition are you putting on yourself? How are you limiting yourself by putting up this wall around who you are? I pray that we can trust enough to be vulnerable, to, to trust that God is there and he's saying, hey, let's talk about this. Let's work through this. Let's continue to grow and improve and be better. But for right now, just know this, you are good enough because I say you're good enough. I pray that we have the strength to recognize the wall in our life, to hear as God tries to speak to you. I pray that we have the strength to let God in. You are loved.
Nothing will change that. Amen.